Mitis Nuvitis Syndrome. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to come to Madrid and speak at your society uh, about tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis. It's called TNU syndrome. Um, we have two major we have we have two major problems with this syndrome. Uh, first question. Uh, I'm not sure it really exists, and I will try to explain to you what this means. And if it exists, it is probably underdiagnosed. It's an interesting disease because it uh, is a multidisciplinary disease that concerns nephrologists, of course, ophthalmologists, rheumatology or internal medicine specialist, it depends on the hospital where you work, and sometimes pediatricians, because uh, about 40% of the cases are pediatric. I'm not a nephrologist, I'm very sorry about that, and thank you to accept me in your society this afternoon. Um, I will not give you a lecture about the renal characteristics of the disease, I'm not able of that, but uh, I will try to uh, explain to you what sort of uh, disease it is, and let us start with a short lesson about uveitis. Uveitis is an inflammatory disease that concerns the eye, and, and it is very important that, you, that the ophthalmologist you work with tells you where uveitis is. And uh, you will see that there are anterior forms of uveitis, which are situated just before the lens, and which are the ones we see mostly in TNU syndromes. There are intermediate uveitis, which concerns the vitreous body, and posterior uveitis, which concerns retina, choroid, and sometimes the optic nerve. Few examples. This young fellow on the left with tearing eyes does not have uveitis. He has a simple, I say simple, but it's not always so simple. He has a simple viral conjunctivitis. This patient on the right hand side of the slide has anterior uveitis. You see these big spickles just behind the cornea. This uveitis is anterior and it's called granulomatous. This is another kind of anterior uveitis. You see this red circle around the iris. It's called iritis. And this type is not granulomatous. You will soon, soon um, understand the importance of that. So the determination of uveitis depends on the segment where it takes place. In tinnitus syndrome, you, s you will see that it, m it is mostly anterior. And the ophthalmologist must be used to working uh, with inflammatory eyes, and it's not the case of all the ophthalmologists. He must tell you if uveitis is granulomatous or not, because you will also see that in tinnitus syndrome, most uveitis are not granulomatous. First description of this syndrome was by Dobrin. It was some 40 two years ago, so it's quite a long time ago, he described two cases of young patients with acute renal failure, secondary to diffuse eosinophilic interstitial nephritis, and these two patients had anterior uveitis, and these two patients also had um, bone marrow granulomas, and one had lymph node granuloma, and evolution in both cases was favorable with cortisone. And notice that uveitis was anterior, but non-granulomatous in both cases. Some 25 years later, uh, Mandeville, who is an ophthalmologist, and this is very important as well, made a literature review of all the cases published since then. Uh, he found 133 cases, and he could gather enough information in 120 of the patients. In 21% of the cases, ocular findings preceded renal failure, and in 65% in 65 of the cases, um, renal, uh, ocular findings followed renal failure. 
Uveitis may happen up to two months before and up to 14 months after the onset of renal failure. And again, in only two cases, uveitis was granulomatous. In 13% of the cases, there were, there were granulomatous infiltrates in renal biopsies. And six patients were, report to, were reported to have granuloma on bone marrow aspirates. Here are Mandeville's criteria, which of course you cannot read, and that you will find in his publication. So I simplified them for this slide. Two important informations. You do not need renal biopsy to make the diagnosis of acute interstitial nephritis if your patient meets all biological criteria for that. Second, uveitis is typically bilateral, anterior, with an onset between two months before up to 12 months after acute interstitial nephritis. Here is a nice slide of acute interstitial nephritis I will not try to comment. Um, one major problem about this syndrome is that the notion of granuloma uh, that Dobrin noticed has disappeared between this first description 40 years ago and Mandeville's criteria. And the fact that Dobrin presents two cases with non caseating granuloma and the fact that Mandeville does not include granuloma in his criteria makes the diagnosis of Tinu syndrome complex. I think the major problem of this syndrome comes from there. So one could say, one could say finally, Tinu syndrome isn't its sarcoidosis, but uveitis in Tinu syndrome is rarely granulomatous and granuloma in the kidney does not mean systemic granulomatous disease. Couldn't it be Sjögren syndrome, but dry eye is more frequent than uveitis in Sjögren syndrome? So we believe that team exists and that it's a real syndrome. In this uh, disease, you can find a lot of general signs, such as fever, headache, dysphagia, dyspnea, meningitis, weight loss. And uh, imagine you don't have time to see your patient, so you send your young medical student, and what should he ask the patient? He should ask what sort of drug did you take in the 20 days before the onset of uh, renal insufficiency. This uh, chart is from Lee's series, which we'll, we will talk about in a few minutes. And you see that in 20% uh, of the cases, uh, there is an intake of antibiotics, so, so simple, such as uh, amoxicillin, 3% non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, drugs, Chinese herbs, 3% because Lee's series is a Chinese series, and other drugs. Uh, infection may induce TNU, such as Epstein-Barr, chlamydia, herpes, but this list is not exhaustive. And how does it work? In fact, some authors reported that some patients with particular HLA phenotypes may be predisposed to TNU, such as HLA-DRB1, O1, O2, and so on. And this patient has an aggression, for example, an infection, and this will stimulate uh, T lymphocytes, which stimulates B lymphocytes, which leads to the production of anti-MCRP antibody. What is this? It is modified C-reactive protein. There are many subtypes of normal C-reactive protein, and these patients develop antibodies on T against these, these modified CRP. These antibodies may act both on kidney and on the eye and explain the disease. This antibody is very interesting because its level is elevated, its level is elevated in Tinu syndrome, is normal in other acute interstitial nephritis, in uh, IgA nephropathy, nephropathy, in Sjögren syndrome, in amyloidosis, and in normal control. And second, its level decreases when the disease improves. So, Tinu syndrome, again, seems to be a real syndrome, and if we want to make studies about this disease, we should discuss the inclusion of patients with granuloma. Uh, but, besides, 
a non causating granuloma on a renal biopsy does not mean the patient has systemic granulomatous disease. Major question, what is the prognosis? In Mandeville's meta-analysis, the renal disease has, has a good prognosis. It tends to resolve spontaneously. He has a few cases with a recurrence of acute interstitial nephritis, five patients on renal dialysis. But don't forget Mandeville is an ophthalmologist. He may have underestimated the renal dysfunction first. And second, with these patients, which are mainly only case reports, we do not have the evolution at one year or later. First and second, uh, the value at that time was given in creatinine level and not in JFR. There are two important series in literature, one uh, Chinese and the other French, which is ours, which I will talk about in a few minutes. Lee reported in 2014 a series of 31 patients with Tinu syndrome. In 42% of the cases, the patients were diagnosed at the time of renal biopsy. That means that uveitis occurred concurrently or before the onset of renal insufficiency. And the other 18 patients, they were considered as late onset uveitis, uh, which happened between 2 to 14 months after biopsy, and they were initially misdiagnosed as drug acute interstitial nephritis at biopsy. And uh, in his series, he had no granuloma in the kidney or in the eye. There is a bad renal prognosis in this Chinese study. As you can see on this chart, 80% um, 80, 80 of the patients are chronic kidney disease 3 or 4 after one year of evolution. We performed a um, French study, a retrospective study, uh, with the help of the French Society of Nephrology and the French Society of Internal Medicine with the Internal uh, Medicine Club uh, and Eye Inflammation, which is called CMIO. Uh, we um, could have the collaboration of 19 hospitals in France and uh, gather the cases of 46 patients. Uh, in our study, the renal uh, prognosis was much better because only 32% of the patients were chronic kidney disease stage 3 or 4 at one, e at one year. We could ev evaluate 35 we could evaluate 35 patients. And now, what is the visual prognosis? In Mandeville's uh, analysis, uh, he observed recurrences of uveitis in 40% of the cases. These u recurrences may happen up to two years, and uh, he noticed that older patients rather had recurrences of uveitis episodes and phases to, and phases between the recurrences where the eye functioned normally and younger patient rather had a chronic course of uveitis uh, over the time. What complications could you see? Uh, complications, 20% of the patients with posterior synechia, optic disc swelling. This is an example. Here, you normally, you can see the edge of the optic disc. Here, you do not see it because of edema. You can also observe cystoid macular edema. This is an example with uh, what is called optical coer optical co coherence tomography, OCT, uh, and you can see this is the retina, and you can see the cysts here in the retina, which enlarge the retina, and which make the central vision very difficult. You also observe retinal detachment, uh, elevated ocular pressure in six patients, with, which may be due to cortisone treatment. Finally, the risk of vision is low. There are no cases of permanent visual loss, and uh, vision is improved uh, to a good value in, in all patients. In Lee's study, 
this uh, visual prognosis is unfortunately not precise. In our study, um, we had 46 patients at the beginning. We excluded five because of diagnosis problems. We included 41. We lost six to follow up. And at one year, we had uh, 35 patients for follow up. Um, it's important to precise which treatment they received. I will come again on that later on. Uh, 20 received a high dose. High dose was about one milligram per kilo per day. 10 received intermediate dose. This was about 0.5 milligram per kilo per day. And five did not receive any cortisone. At one year of follow-up, 46% of uveitis relapses, which uh, looks like what is seen in literature. Fewer relapses at one year if high dose of cortisone and uh, no significant difference between uh, intermediate dose and no cortisone groups um, which on, 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 on relapses. But taken together, few relapses when patients has received corticosteroids. This chart to, to show that uh, if patient receives no cortisone, no corticosteroids, he will have a median number of relapses of two in one year. And if patient receives high dose of cortisone, as you see here, <coughs> he uh, has about 100% uh, percent of chance not to have persistent uveitis. Complications, five glaucomas, cataracts and one ocular ischemia syndrome which is particularly severe. At one year, four patients with signs of chronic anterior uveitis and again one with cystoid macular edema which here is a different way of seeing that. It's, an, it's a fluorescenic angiography and you can see here the accumulation of fluorescein in the, the, the cystoid macular edema region. What treatment, finally? In Mandeville series, uh, authors used corticosteroid, adetioprine, methotrexate, cyclosporine, mycophenolate. <clears throat> In Lee's series, all patients received uh, 0.8 milligram per, kilo, per kilogram per day for six to eight weeks, and then progressive tire, uh, taper up to uh, six months. Um, four received a bit less because of diabetes. Uh, ten received uh, pulse therapy with methylprednisolone. And 11 patients uh, received cyclophosphamide up to a median uh, a cumulative dose of four to six grams. In our study, as I told you, uh, 20, person, uh, 20 patients with a high dose, 10 an intermediate. Uh, at one year of follow-up, there was no difference between serum creatinine level in high intermediate and, untre in, and untreated group. But uh, the percentage of variation, see, which is not written here, seemed to be uh, positive. Um, but again, groups were small and patients not randomized and treatment was prescribed by different practitioners in different hospitals. So, at the end, what could we do, what should we do with TNU syndrome? Of course, prescribe, of, of course, use cortisone. But if the patient is known to be fragile, if we use literature data, if we use least data, if he's older, he ha if he has bad initial renal function, if he has failure to regain, to regain good renal function three months after biopsy, if there is concurrent thyroid disease and prominent leukocyturia, if there is higher levels at the beginning of serum creatinine or uh, inflammation syndrome, elevate, elevated sedimentation rate. Uh, by the way, in our study, we did not uh, find the same uh, value of thyroid diseases and prominent leukocyturia. We saw that it did not modify the, the end uh, renal function, but it did in Lee's study. If the patient is Asiatic, um, why not use methylprednisolone pulse therapy, then one milligram per kilo per day, with a progressive taper, 
at six, nine months or more. Um, could, should we, could we add cyclophosphamide? Because probably that, that corticosteroids alone would not be sufficient. Why wouldn't we use mycophenolate? With how long? One year? Why not? I think it would be very interesting to create a European study group about this subject. Why? Because um, we, it, it took us a lot of time to gather these 46 patients. Uh, and I think that um, we could, for example, find 10 patients a year per country. So if someone is interested, uh, we could have 100 patients in two years if some countries participate to that study. Take home messages. Um, it's an undiagnosed syndrome. Um, don't forget to evaluate renal function when uveitis first, but of course, uh, I think uh, nephrologists will not see those patients uh, naturally, so uh, ophthalmologists must be aware of these patients because they do not always send these patients to us. Why? Because normally when you have anterior non-granulomatous uveitis, it is usually related to HLA-B27 and um, this um, makes the diagnosis simple. But if it's not related to HLA-B27, we should think that this m could be a TNU syndrome and we should be aware of the patient and follow its renal function at 3, 6, 9, 12 months, even a bit later. But in fact, who does? Um, on the contrary, in case of acute tubular interstitial nephritis, don't forget to watch the eye at three months, six months, nine months, 12, why not? And because um, uveitis does not always mean red eye, and sometimes the patient has only a slightly uh, diminution of his visual function. Sometimes acute tubular interstitial nephritis, thought to be secondary to drugs, is in fact Tinu syndrome. Mind differential diagnosis, as we said, don't forget that renal and ocular prognosis is sometimes severe, that this patient, as we said, requires prolonged follow-up, requires multidisciplinary work, and uh, the most important uh, person, I think, in this work is the ophthalmologist, because he must be aware of inflammation in the eye, and this is not the case of all the ophthalmologists to work with. And many unresolved questions remain, such as pathophysiology, the role of MCRP, the treatments that we talked about. So, thank you very much for your kind attention, and if someone is interested, here is my email address and my phone number. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Philippe, for this comprehensive uh, lecture on a, on a very interesting topic. Uh, questions from the audience? Yes, number two, and then number one, sorry. Matthias Kiponat, many thanks for this beautiful lecture. Could you precise the thyroid disease which you mentioned? It should be Hashimoto disease, grave disease of others. It is all sorts of thyroid diseases. It, it's mainly hypothyroidia but not autoimmune. It is autoimmune, of course. Autoimmune, auto of course, yes. Thank yes. you. Question, thank you. microphone one. Hello. Uh, Hello, I would also like to thank you for a very wonderful and illuminating talk, and I would just like to ask you to expand a bit on the conclusion number one, where you actually hinted or said many things about what we nephrologists should do when we have a patient with acute tubal interstitial nephritis. Now, if I have been um, informed by my colleagues in ophthalmology, in ophthalmology correctly, there is a significant proportion of patients with U uveitis who are relatively asymptomatic. So no eye pain, no really very visible things on the outside, no noticeable loss of visual acuity. Mm -hmm. Should we as nephrologists then uh, perform or uh, institute a full ophthalmological consult with every patient with acute tubal interstitial nephritis? It wouldn't be a huge undertaking. This is 
the numbers okay. are relatively small and not only at the time of biopsy but also six twelve months afterwards would that be reasonable it's uh, thank you for this very good question um, 